The following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Hello and welcome. You are along the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network on what has turned out, we're recording this program on what's turned out to be a mildly snowy mid-March day in Western Oregon, which is an odd occurrence for this part of the country, but these are odd times. I'm Claire Hall, <laughs> and I'm very happy to welcome once again a dear friend and my co-host on the program, Gabriel Schechter. How are you, sir? Uh, you were saying before we started that this was the first snow you've seen all season? Well, yes, absolutely. Um, woke up to a little bit of snow on the ground and the leaves and stuff, but uh, the sun hasn't come out, but the snow has melted by now. But it was startling to wake up to. Yeah. Now, it was, I'm sure, very different uh, during the years you were living in upstate New York and uh, working at a uh, little place uh, <laughs> called the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in uh, Cooperstown. Uh, snow was a pretty regular part of your winter then, I'm assuming? It was always a pleasant surprise to wake up and find no fresh snow. Oh wow! Oh wow! <laughs> Listen, the day I the day I started packing to move to Oregon, we got forty three inches of snow in central New York. Good lord! And 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 what t- kind of time span are we talking there? One day. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I said, include me home. out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you came back to. Green and damp, but uh, usually snow-free Western Oregon, and good to have you here. Uh, We want to talk about that eight-year period where you were a researcher at the Giamatti Research Center at the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And uh, I've got to say, you know, for any true fan of the game, and especially its history, in many aspects, it's you've made it clear to me it was it was like a, a fanboy or fangirl's dream come true. And one of the big things, I'm sure, and that's what we want to focus on today, is the experience of meeting so many Hall of Famers. And uh, uh, we're just going to bounce around, and which suits the odd odd way my mind functions and you were telling me before we started you had divided hall of famer encounters into some categories and so yes how about if we start off with a good story about a nice guy encounter working at the hall of fame um in the upstairs offices you occasionally get the rumor that so-and-so is down in the plaque gallery. Of course, the plaque gallery is the great hub of uh, the museum. And so uh, one one winter uh, day, word got around that Juan Marichal was down in the plaque gallery. And so I went down, and there were only three people in the gallery, Marichal and two friends who had come with him, from the Dominican for he was filming something, uh, working on something for the Hall of Fame. So there he was. And I went up, introduced myself. We have these little you know, employee badges, so he knew I worked there. And I said, I just want you to know what a tremendous joy and pleasure it was to watch you pitch. Ah. And uh, he just he, he, he just melted. Oh, after that, and we we talked for five or ten minutes. And what I, one thing I recall is that he called his friends over to to introduce them to me, and it seemed clear that it was their honor to be meeting me, and not the other way around. Just oh. because I worked there, I guess, and just because Marichal is is quite a, a gracious man. I later had a chance to spend. Oh, a half hour or so on the phone with him. And just, just a great, warm gentleman. 
that that was uh, that was quite memorable. On another occasion, uh, it, word got around that Johnny Bench was down in the uh, Plank Gallery. This was more in the spring or summer, and there was a bigger crowd in there. And in fact, there were three or four kids who were around him. And I waited for them to clear out, and then I went up and introduced myself. I, I had not met him before. And he looked at my badge, and he says, uh, what do you do here? And I said, I'm a researcher in the library. And he said, ah, oh, there's too much research. <laughs> really growled with quite a bit of his hostility. Seriously? Um, excuse me? Seriously? Wow. Oh, oh yeah, he yeah, absolutely meant it. Uh, so that was the last words we exchanged. Um, I had nothing more to say to him. Yeah, really? Let me, let me tell you my, my, my favorite, and this wasn't quite an encounter, but every year the newly elected Hall of Famers spend a day, sometimes two, in Cooperstown, usually in April or May. And it's a, it's an orientation. Some of them have visited Cooperstown before. Many of them haven't, especially now that there's no longer a major league exhibition game during induction okay. weekend. Anyway, uh, and they're shown around town, and they get a tour of the whole museum. There's a reception for staff at which you get to meet them. And... Uh, Part of the tour is coming through the library, and so I've had a chance to talk with many of them. And my favorite uh, library tour was Ricky Henderson. Okay. Now, I'm going to try to describe the scene. This was upstairs, right outside my office, in an area that's mostly filled with files and stored uh hard copies of the sporting news and sporting life and things like that. And there are mm -hmm. several counters in there where you can, where you can do some work. And on one of these counters, they had, as they usually do for the new, new hall of famers, a display of some of the clippings from their clipping files, photos, maybe some artifacts, some small artifacts that can be gathered on a table and, uh, whoever is giving the tour to the Hall of Famer comes through, and we point out this is this, this came from there, and the player gets to see things written about them and, and some of the images and stuff. But and it, it's always pretty cool for them to to see that. Nice. So here came Ricky. Here came Ricky Henderson with Eric Stroll, who then was a brand new uh, senior curator. He had taken over from. Ted Spencer, who worked there for a long time. And this was actually Eric's first tour with the Hall of Famer. And there was quite a display on the counter, clippings, photos. And there were a couple of uh, comic books. One of uh, one which was called The Man of Steel, S-T-E-A-L. Ricky uh -huh. Henderson, The Man of, Man of Steel comic book. And it was, I love it it. was there on the counter. And so... The other researcher and I were on one side of this kind of r r long rectangular table, and, and Eric Stroll and Ricky Henderson were on the other side. So mm -hmm. Eric and Ricky were, were side by side, and Eric was trying to explain to him what all these things were. And mm -hmm. Eric threw in a couple of $3 words. <laughs> and I I... I, I, I I was facing Ricky Henderson, and I could see the eyes kind of flicker and flinch. <laughs> and they, what's he saying? And uh -huh. his attention started to wander. He's looking around at things, and I can hear he's not. He's sort of half glancing at Eric. And, and Eric finally said something about how these clippings are more tactile than. <laughs> And I, I swear, I actually saw Ricky Henderson's A's eyes glaze over oh, when Lord. Eric said tactile. And yeah. Ricky picked up the Man of Steel comic book and, and read the comic book while Eric kept telling him what the rest of the stuff was. <laughs> oh, it was oh, a beautiful moment to behold. That's right. <laughs> uh, 
let's see another category did you ha did you is there one that you might uh classify as most unusual um <laughs> well all right here's an unusual one uh do you know the a lot of baseball fans know the famous story of Richie Ashburn uh, with the original Mets in 1962. Roger Angel Yo tells Tingo. a story in one of his books. And yes. it's a story about how Elio Chacon, the, the Spanish-speaking shortstop, uh, did not understand Richie Ashburn yelling, I got it, I got it, on short fly balls. And they, they kept colliding. Uh -huh. And finally... Ashburn went to somebody and said, how do you say I got it in Spanish, for goodness sakes? And they said, oh, Yola Tango. Uh -huh. And so Ashburn started yelling, Yola Tango, Yola Tango, on, on pop up the short left center. And Chacon peeled off one day, but Frank Thomas, the left fielder, didn't speak Spanish, and he just, smug, just flattened Ashburn. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's a story. In, yes. in the early 90s, I was interviewing a lot of uh, ex-players, and I got I, – d I did some interviews um, in, uh, in Philadelphia, and I got a press pass, a, a clubhouse pass, a full pass for a doubleheader. And between games of the doubleheader, I got to eat in the um, press dining room. And so there we were between the games, and I, I and I went to the restroom. And coming out of the restroom, there was like a little anteway between the door into the restroom and the door out to the dining hall. Okay. And as I came out the one door, here came Richie Ashburn through the other door, and we had a just a little brush, uh -huh. just brushed against each other. I said, Yola Tango, Richie, Yola Tango. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we got a big laugh out of that. So that, that would be the most unusual, I think. Uh, um, okay. How about uh, a surprising one? Because, you know, anybody who's a celebrity, whether in sports or life, you know, any phase of life, seems to gain a reputation as, you know, a friendly person, a surly person, an approachable, an aloof person. Is there anybody of the many hall members that you met and said, gee, this goes, this really goes against what I might have expected of him? I think there was a group reaction to uh one of the staff receptions for an incoming Hall of Famer. Uh -huh. And uh, the guy had kind of a negative rep reputation, kind of a surly guy. And he, he came in and he spoke to us for about 20 minutes. I'm going to talk, I'll get around to his name. Okay. He brought his wife with him, as many of them did. But a lot of what he told us was uh, his wife was his high school sweetheart. And he told us of their journey together mm -hmm. through the early stages of his baseball career and into the major leagues and stardom and now into the Hall of Fame. By then, they'd been married over 32 years. And his whole, his whole approach to us in, in that speech was, look at this wonderful woman and this wonderful love we've had that have seen us through this amazing journey. And it was a really very human side to to a man that that struck us all uh, very charmingly. Okay. Here's a on um, uh, on not quite the opposite side. There was the day. Um, this would have been 2010, I guess. Um, Doug Harvey. And Whitey Herzog were inducted the same year. Okay. And they hated each other. They had oh. been <laughs> Harvey had been uh, Herzog's nemesis and vice versa. And ah. so it was very interesting to see 
um, what happened at the hall, at least just the part of it that I saw. Now, Harvey also gave a wonderful speech at the staff meeting. He had already been suffering from cancer for a while, and I think he died within a couple of years of his election. No, no. But he gave a very impassioned speech to us about the role of the umpire and how those, basically how those poor players are helpless without an umpire, that they wouldn't be able to get through two, two, get two innings of a game without an umpire, and, and, and how <laughs> almost religiously he took that, um, that calling. And everybody who saw him work would, would attest to it. So when we got to talk to him, I told him that he had long been a hero of mine, which he had, Oh, and okay. that uh, about 25 years earlier, I had, I had done some umpiring uh, for a couple of springs in uh, Las Vegas. And he said to me, you're my hero. Oh. Anybody who gets out there, who puts that equipment on there and goes out there is a hero to me. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's a great, great. Story. That was really cool. And then. I forget, it was a couple of weeks or a few weeks later, Whitey Herzog came through town. And uh, my um, my exchange with him was not part of the reception or anything. It, it was just during a quiet moment when he was talking with someone else, and I stood there just for a minute or two. And what we heard Whitey Herzog was talking with, to tell us was a very – hostile story about Doug Harvey. He told us that about uh, that that Harvey liked to call box on them on Herzog's team that he wouldn't call on anybody else. And w w one day Doug Harvey was at second base and one of his protégés uh, I forget who he said it was. One of his protégés called a balk on Herzog's oh. pitcher. And while That's Herzog right. is out there arguing, he sees Harvey at second base just applauding, standing there <laughs> applauding. And okay. for Herzog, this was proof that Harvey, Harvey was out to get him. It just it struck us all oddly. The staffers tend to have the same kinds of reactions to the Hall of Famers because the Hall of Famers' behavior is pretty consistent. When they have class, they show it. When they don't, they show it. Um, and, uh, boy, we were all really taken aback that, first of all, that he still felt that hostility, and second, that he would express it to staffers who just a couple of weeks earlier had met Doug Harvey and been so impressed by him. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of sad and surprising, but in a way... Uh, I'm wondering if it was your experience in some of your interviews with ex-players that you get the feeling that some of these guys mellow in their old age, but some of them really hold on to grudges. That's absolutely true. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, oh. uh, I had a little uh, interesting experience with Joe Torrey. Long okay. before he was a Hall of Famer, I don't know if that counts under our uh, our topic oh, sure. heading, but uh, I think so. Also part of that, also part of my experiences in the uh, this was in the early to mid nineties when I interviewed a lot of ex players for a book that never got written, and okay. uh, one of the toughest people to arrange an interview with was Joe Torrey. He was managing the Cardinals at the time, which was no picnic, and I was on the road. And I was calling the the Cardinals PR guy every day to see if I could get a commitment and writing and calling and sure. writing. And finally, sure. finally it came through. I would get to see Joe Torrey at Bush Stadium, you know, a couple of hours before game time. Great. Now, I was interested in Joe Torrey because he had been the um, Braves – player representative in the union in the late 60s when their GM, Paul Richards, was as hostile to the union as anybody in baseball. And in fact, before the 19, uh, 
69 season, he traded Joe Torre to the Cardinals just to get rid of him because he was a player rep. Um, wow. So there was a lot to talk to Torrey about. He was very active. And, and, and some of the photos that are still passed around um, of the early player union days, uh, Torrey and Marvin Miller are very prominent. So I had very specific questions uh, for Torrey. And I, I, unlike a lot of interviewers, he met, I, my agenda was specific. I wanted to talk about labor relations. I didn't mm-hmm. want to talk about his favorite home run or, or where he used to eat when he lived, played in the minors. I wanted to talk about labor really fine. Sure. So I got to his office and uh, turned on my cassette recorder, and I asked him the first question, which was about Paul Richards trading him. And from the first sentence, he was right into the middle of it. Joe uh-huh. Torrey was as friendly as candid as um, as as informative as as any player I talked with. He was fantastic. He was right there back on the time of of his fights with Paul Richards and (laughs) Gussie Bush. He was there for Gussie Bush's big blow up too. Anyway, so we talked for about a half hour and unannounced, Possibly prearranged with Tori. I can't rule it out. Uh, Jack Buck, their announcer, just walked in on us, apparently not even noticing me, and launched into into this long tirade to Tori about something stupid that Mike Shannon, his broadcast partner, had said on the air to take the night before. <laughs> and he talked and talked and talked, and then he stopped and Tori looked over at me and I said, well, I guess we're done. <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe it was, it was planned, but the thing is Tori walked out and wow, leaving me with Jack Buck <laughs> who instantly pretended or either thought he knew me or thought he had to pretend that he knew me started talking to me as if we were old buddies. And of course this was not the case. Right. This was not the case. I was still kind of dazed from this fantastic interview with Joe Torrey ending abruptly. <laughs> wow. So, wow. It's Jack Buck. Yeah, but Torrey was great. <laughs> cool. Cool. Um, you know, the time is speeding along, and I know we're not going to get, it is. you know, we're going to get more than one program out of this, but I think we've Probably Let me throw time. one more story at you. Yeah, I was going to say one more good story, and then we'll wrap for this week. Right. It's 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 my other story about an unpleasant encounter with a Hall of Famer. Okay. But it's a good okay. one. It's a good one to end on. Okay. Uh, this happened maybe seven or eight years ago on induction weekend. Cooperstown is crazy on induction weekend, and and one of the reasons is that there are autograph signings all up and down Main Street. It has become a cottage industry for Hall of Famers and others to set up booths and and major shows with lots of people available for autographs. And a friend of mine was working at one of these, and I stopped by to see him. And uh, it was sort of chaos, but it was late in the day. And I spotted Whitey Ford at the table. Um, And I told my friend Bob, oh, I have always wanted to meet Whitey Ford. And I hadn't met him when I worked at the hall. I wasn't working there anymore. And I said, I've always wanted to meet him because there's the most amazing coincidence in our lives, which Mm -hmm. is that the day he got married out on Long Island, about four miles away, I was born that same morning. Wow. I mean, that's a cool coincidence. It's, huh? it's remarkable. You know, and, yeah. and just a few miles apart on the north shore of Long Island. Yeah. So I wanted to share this with Whitey Ford. Bob said, fine, get, get in line. When you get up, I'll introduce you. And uh-huh. I got to the line, and my friend Bob introduces Tells why is my, my friend here is amazing that 
And he starts to tell him about my being born the same day Whitey Ford was getting married. And he got like two uh, halfway through it and Ford just brushed him off and looked up at me and said, I don't give a shit about that. You got something to sign? <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of sad. I said, I said, I said, no, I don't have anything for you to sign. Walked away. Wow, wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, any sense was was he just having a bad day, or is that no? Uh, my friend explained that he was mainly uh, eager to get out of there and start drinking. Ah, he was ah. an hour or so later. He was spotted, and they have a parade up and down Main Street with the Hall of Famers and open cars and all that. And why do you force uh-huh. in his open car chugging a beer in the parade? <laughs> uh-huh. So that was his mission. Okay. I don't I think he genuinely did not care that yeah. anything interested had happened in regard to a fan. I think it was that mm-hmm. simple. <laughs> mm-hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Well, it takes all kinds in this world, does it not? Though sometimes oh, we have to wonder why. Yeah. Gabriel Schechter, thank you for uh, <laughs> raising the curtain and letting us peek behind the scenes, uh, you know, at uh, the lives and in a more personal way, uh, getting to know Hall of Famers. And, uh, you know, uh, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate dream job in uh, so many ways, and glad you had the experience, and glad you're able to share it with us. So, thank you, and thank you on both counts. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, take care, and thanks everybody for listening to Claire's Corner. And until we meet again, happy trails. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.